Thank you very much. Um, I think I first used Open Risk in 2002. Um, I'm speaking here with my um, vice chair of the M Bench Group hat on, not my Ember Cosm hat on. And it's my turn to give this talk. Um, uh, we, various of us, give this talk at various events. So let me tell you about M Bench. Yep. So this is driven by a frustration from Dave Patterson at the only thing anyone cares about for a processor is its core mark score. And core mark is one small synthetic benchmark, and it has had a positive effect on compilers, and we're getting close to the, oh, I recognize this is a core mark, let me give you just the right answer, and it's becoming increasingly unhelpful. So we wanted to come up with a new benchmark suite that would be better for giving you insights into the qualities of a core. And we can look back in history. And let's look at some of the main uh, benchmark programs that have been out there for a while. The old ones, Linpack, used for high performance computing. Drystone, an early synthetic benchmark. Spec CPU, um, early consortium approach of a set of benchmarks. Core mark, I've just mentioned, and MLPerf. How many people here have heard of MLPerf? Oh, wow, that's quite impressive. Um, right, okay, MLPerf is a new benchmark suite for uh, machine learning. And can I just check, people have heard of the others? If, hands up if you've heard of the other benchmark suites? Yeah, I thought so. Okay, so let's look at these and learn from history. Um, so we're going back right back to the 70s. They have different things thereafter. Limpax for HPC, Drystone is for systems programmers, specs aimed at the server market, uh, core market, the embedded, uh, ML perfect machine learning. And with the exception of spec, they don't have a particularly good reputation. You can get a really high Limpax score and get to the top of the top 500 as a supercomputer and not actually be useful for any real pro problems because all it does is measure compute on an embarrassingly parallel problem. And if you've got a high performance compute which has got a lot of processors and no connectivity, you'll have a great impact score and not be any use. Um, how much do they cost? Well, they're all free except for the one that I said had a good reputation which is spec which is most definitely not free. It's an industry consortium but you pay to join to that consortium. They're all actually reasonably easy to port. There's no tick against MLPerf because it's so new, we don't really have data. We could claim it's easy to port, but let's have other people say that. How well kept up to date are they? Well, apart from spec, these are not regularly updated. MLPerf is planned to be updated regularly because it's very new, so it hasn't had an opportunity to be updated. Um, all Limpack, Drystone, and Core Marker are single programs. You've only got to be good at one program and then you're shown as being good. Spec and MLPerf are groups of programs, uh, depending on which version of spec between 10 and 23 programs, seven in the current version of MLPerf. And do they have an organization behind them? Drystone doesn't. It was just published in Ryan Vika's paper. And that's it. There's no organization. Limpack does actually have someone looking after it. So does Spec, Core Mark, and MLPerf. And do they have a summary score? Well, Limpack talks about floating point operations or trillions of floating point operations. Um, dry stone is just a speed ratio. How do you compare to the, the baseline? Spec is interesting because it uses a geometric mean. And the nice thing about geometric means is they stop any one program dominating more than just an ordinary arithmetic mean. And it's of a speed ratio, so it's compared to some baseline. Core mark is again a speed ratio compared to a baseline. And MLPerf has gone for the speed ratio and actually has a standard deviation. And I believe it's a geometric standard deviation as well. And where do they come from? Academia, academia, industry and academia, academia, industry and academia. 
And so you see the ones that are start to have a good reputation or have good qualities come from a mixture of academia and industry. You need the industry focus, you need the intellectual input of academia. I should just be clear, the reason ML Perf has a low reputation is it hasn't had long enough to get a high reputation. So you start low and you build up. It's not that it, it's a designed to be bad. Um, let's look then on to some that are less widely used. Um, embassy, I know embassy is well known, but very, it's actually surprisingly little used because it is hard to get hold of because it costs money. Um, and my bench, which is a widely, or me bench, is a widely used um, open source benchmark suite from University of Michigan. Beebs is the one I, my team was behind, which came out of the energy efficiency research we did a few years ago. Um, and Tackle Bench is a worst case execution time. Um, uh, benchmark suite and actually Beebs and Tackle Bench build on my bench and other benchmarks so the open the, these academic benchmarks tend to build on each other um, they're not widely enough used that people have started to talk about their quality so we can just put a question mark against them interestingly all except embassy are free okay embassy is a consortium thing you have to be part of the consortium to have access to that which costs money are they easy to port? Generally they are with the exception of embassy. Embassy is notoriously hard to port. Um, embassy is occasionally updated, uh, hasn't been recently. My bench never been updated. Tackle bench is relatively new, but it's never been updated. Beebs is updated fairly regularly. And they all are groups of programs. Okay. Do they have an organization supporting them? Not really. Um, apart from Embassy, which has this consortium, and you pay to belong to the consortium. Um, do they have a summary score? And this is one reason, perhaps, why they're not so well known. There isn't a button where you can say, my Embassy score is, my Beebs score is. Where do they come from? Embassy is pure industry, my bench and tackle bench pure academica. Beebs came out of a government-funded industry academia consortium. So that's Embacosm and Bristol, which are the B and the E of Beebs. So those are the benchmarks that are out there. So what can we do to make it better? We can draw some lessons from this about the things that seem to be good in all these cases. First of all, if you want people to use it, it has to be free. Okay, That's the big blocker on spec and embassy. Unless you pay a lot of money to be part of the consortium, you can't use them. It's got to be easy to port and run. It's no good if we say, well, you can have this, but please set aside an engineer for six months to get it going. One thing that becomes clear is you've got to live in the world of real programs. Synthetic benchmarks last for a short time before they actually, people get hold of them and then play to the synthetic features. They're too predictable. And typically, they're very hard to do, which is why you get them in one-offs, not as suites. So we're focused on real programs, or at least program kernels. They need to be maintained. So MBench must have a supporting organization to maintain it. And actually, people do like to be able to summarize. So we must have a way of summarizing how well you've done. Um, and if we're going to do that summarizing, let's at least use a summarizing score that actually makes it hard, gives you the best mix. And so we're going for geometric mean and geometric standard deviation. And common theme was the successful benchmark suites are the ones that have industry and academia involved. So those are the seven lessons we used. So where do we get to? Um, like so many projects you don't want to start with too many people involved so we started with just four of us who are interested Dave Patterson who wanted to replace core mark me because I was involved with mbench and knew Dave through risk 5 Palmer de Belt because of his involvement with risk 5 and Cesare Garlatti and I'll come back to Cesare's work because it's important um, who was very fo much focused on more than just the functional performance but the real-time performance and we met face to face in the first few months of this year in California. And we used as our starting point Beebs. 
And the reason for that is it seemed it was a collection of real programs for small systems. And we realized that we couldn't do everything at once, so we thought we'd sm focus on small systems. The IoT class embedded processor. And then in June, we widened the group open to all, and we've had great contributions from ARM. I think, is John Taylor still here? Yeah, John's here. He's been putting a great deal of input from ARM. We've had uh, Ofer Shinar from uh, Western Digital putting input, and we've had others contributing from a wide range of, of companies. It had, and we needed the supporting organization. And though we all originally, the original group came out of RISC-V, we were clear this was not a RISC-V project. It was for all processors. And it was essential we got out from underneath that RISC-V envelope. And FOSI was the obvious place to go, which is why we're now a sub-project of FOSI. We have a mailing list. You can sign up for it. And we have a monthly conference call. And if you go to mbunch.org, you can find the links to all of that. Um, and our goal is to get this all polished and some good reference baselines in time for Embedded World, which will be the launch of the first version. Um, and I wouldn't be standing here, of course, if it wasn't all freely available. It's under a GPL license. Why is it under a GPL license? Because it incorporates lots of other free programs, some of which are GPL licensed, and it's the one overarching license we can put them all under. So what's the current status? There's 19 benchmarks out, of, out there. They're designed to work on systems with 64K of ROM and 64K of RAM. We are missing some. We'd like a Bluetooth LE kernel in there to capture that sort of program. We'd like an elliptic curve DSA program in there. We have some ideas of whether the elliptic curve DSA we think we're going to pull from the ARM embed um, uh, code, which is open, so we can use that. Um, we also have Cesare Garlatti's work, and I haven't really said much about this, which is we want to be able to benchmark how well systems do in terms of context switching and interrupt latency. And we have a prototype piece of code for RISC-V. And this code has to be written in assembly, okay, unless we want to tie it to a particular operating system. Okay? And the idea we're going towards down there is a set of rules for how you write the best context switching and interrupt latency testing program, and then you get someone to write in an assembler for a particular architecture. And so it's not going to be a bit of code you port. It's going to be a set of rules that you use to write the code to evaluate this for your program. We wanted to make this very easy to build and use. As soon as you go into make-based tools, you start to run into issues around it won't work on Windows or Mac, and it becomes a pile of complexity. And actually, this is 19 small programs. Okay? It shouldn't be heavyweight. So we've actually gone for some Python build and benchmarking scripts. Those are still under revision. Improvements very welcome. We have an offer from Western Digital that next year we're actually going to pick up their build framework because that's going to be opened up, and that will give us a more polished build framework. But this will do for now. So far, most of the results are with RISC-V, and a big part of what I'm doing is trying to get ARM, ARC, MIPS, whatever, in there, so we actually get a wide range of architectures. And we need to, we have done a little bit of work with real hardware, but at the moment, it's mostly with very later models of hardware, and actually getting this to work with real hardware is quite an important aspect of what we need to go forward on. So. This is good for people on both the software and the hardware side. I'm a compiler man. So it's good to look at compiled code speed. And here we have the baseline data. The baseline, remember I said we're going to do, we're going to use ratios for this and geometric mean as those ratios. There is a baseline which is the benchmark compiled with GCC9 for RISC-V for the pulp architecture and executed on the RISC-E core. And that's an arbitrary choice of a baseline. Everything's compared to that. And if we look at that, we've got GCC. Um, we've got the current uh, LLVM. They both, LLVM and GCC, both run at about the same speed. There's an, a prototype. Uh, there's an early a, embedded ABI for GCC. That makes it run slower because it's designed for smaller code. LTO makes things run faster. 
and we've got some new size optimizations which make the code smaller, but they make it run slower. And you'll notice I've got error bars there, and that's the geometric standard deviation. So you can see, for example, that LTO generally makes things go faster on the same processor, but clearly some things it makes go slower and some things it makes go a lot faster. And those error bars really matter for you to say, see that things aren't uniform in how they behave. We can look at code size. So here we can see a whole load of things. We can see GCC's improved a bit. So there's my baseline. There's the latest GCC upstream, which is a, a 1 or 2% smaller in code size. Our new size optimizations make it even smaller. If you use combined elimination, which is a form of iterative compilation, it gets smaller still. And LTO is actually very good for code size, makes it even smaller. LLVM upstream is bigger than GCC. But the la latest LLVM with patches that aren't yet upstream, but you can get off our website, are actually comparable with GCC for size. And just before the RISC-V community gets too self-indulgent, there's ARM. And ARM out of the box just about beats the lot. Okay, so RISC-V has still more work to do. But from a hardware point of view, you can look at this to evaluate hardware. So how good is the proposed bit manipulation instruction set extensions from Clifford Wolf and his team? And so if we take GCC, we've implemented the bit manipulation in GCC with colleagues from Sci-5 um, and Clifford. And actually, that saves you 2 or 3% on code size. And it does the same for LLVM. So bit manipulation looks like out of the box, even these are very early versions of compilers. We haven't even, we're only scratched the surface on, on what we could do with that instruction set. But that looks to be a hardware improvement that's going to be great for the embedded market space that wants to improve code size. Um, and I've left ARM up there just for reference. So you can use this to look at how's this ISA variation. I'm a hardware engineer, how's it going to uh, affect me? Um, you can go into detail. So these are just the headline scores, the geometric mean of the ratio against the baseline along with its standard deviations. Let me just tell you something about this bit manip because you'll notice that the bit manip has got a decent error bar on it. And here we can see that we can look at the individual programs and see how they compare. And we'll see that the bit manipulation instruction set extension doesn't make anything worse. On several programs makes it a little bit better but on SHA-256 makes it 28% better in terms of code size. And that's important to understand that some of these improvements will actually only affect certain programs. And so you, do, you are able to bury inside by having a suite and look at what's happening in one place. I've talked to the, the, part of the, compiler, the, the compiler teams do tell me that actually this is also because we've just done the one optimization that benefits SHA-256 you'll probably see similar improvements with CRC32 and some of the others as the compiler advances to take advantage of this extension. But that you can delve in and look at more information. So where are we? We are. We've got a suite of 19 programs. We're focusing initially on the IoT class embedded processors. The scores are geometric means and standard deviations relative to an arbitrary baseline platform. We've got the organization created and sitting under FOSI. We've got plan in progress to release the full version in early 2020. And please help. Thank you. I'm not so sure if the standard deviation is a good uh, thing because you say none of the tests have become worse, but if you look at the, the bar chart, the, the opposite side is over the, the, the one. So I've been doing similar things before and there we just looked at 99% and 1% or so of, the, of the, the distribution and not try to fit a standard mean, standard deviation. So um, I think this is one that I will let the statisticians can beat themselves up over. None of these scores are perfect. We've got too small a set to make, have a meaningful percentile because then the actual statistical error in selecting the percentile, you know, have I ended up in the percentile, wouldn't work. Uh, 
geometric, the reason we use geometric standard deviations is it would be inappropriate to use a standard deviation if you're using a geometric mean. Um, so we use a geometric standard deviation, which is an asymmetric standard deviation. So you'll notice that those bars, if you look closely, are not actually symmetric around the end of the bars. It, yeah, you have to ultimately don't get too carried away with just looking at the pictures. You know, if you're going to start looking at this, do understand the statistics behind it. Um, it's a measure of variability. It's not actually telling you where your bounds are um, on the particular program. Just to follow that one up with two comments. Uh, one, you might find that the max and the mean, or excuse me, the, the max and the min across the set do a better job than the standard deviation. But the other comment I wanted to make was uh, I can provide a, a rather uh, unusual ISA, perhaps not that unusual, that would be a fun one to try against. Oh, it's on my list. It's on my list. Yes, please. Uh, I welcome that. If you'd like to contribute it, that will be good. Uh, the, it's open for today. I mean, l let's have the debate about what we use. Max and min, you could argue, wouldn't necessarily give you... I mean, it means one thing dominates. Yes, Just, sir. Uh, okay, so yeah, there's pros and cons of all of these. Um, ultimately, if there's a consensus about what to do, we're not religiously wedded to geometric mean and standard deviation. So. Yes, sir. I see these, um, the measurements are code size. Do you have performance measurements, like, you know, instructions per cycle and that kind of stuff? The very first one I had was compiled code speed. Um, the reason, the, the part, partly that is the newness. It's a lot easier to measure code size because I don't necessarily have to be able to run the right. programs. With these, to run them, I need to have a platform to run on that's tied into making sure I've got systems. And because these are deeply embedded, they don't use printf. They're very library light. Um, so I need to have a target where I can actually measure the boundaries. And the, there is a level of, which I didn't go into, the programs run several times to hot up the cache. And then you trigger timing, and then you run, and then you trigger top. And typically that's done with a GDB type interface, where you break point when you're ready to start timing, count the cycles, run the program, break point when you're ready to stop timing. And so you really need to have a GDB server that's capable of that. It's not the only way of doing it, and it's still under discussion how we do it. What, what will be the measurements? Is it going to be instruction per cycle or wall clock time? So, kind of? so the measurement um, is execution time, okay? Um, and there is a normalization factor in there, but each program is intended to run for about four seconds real time, okay? And then actually the data, we expect the data to be quoted both as an absolute, you know, both as a, your score relative to the benchmark is X, and your score relative to the benchmark per MIPS is X, because this is nominally a 1 megahertz risk v uh, pulp uh, core. Okay. okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank, thank you. Me.